Welcome to The Scott Townsend Show, brought to you by Dietzel Man Productions. Vacation, you should take it if you feel comfortable taking it and your parents agree with it, all those things. I made sure I was covered there. And I said, no. I said, yes, he can. I do believe he can completely heal. You don't have to deal with it anymore for the rest of your life. Or no, because you choose to make that thing bigger than God. Okay? Not realizing what a controversial statement that was to make in church. Okay? But what it did do is it opened up discussion with one of my leaders who completely disagreed with what I said. You know? And that's healthy. I think that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Hey, this is Scott Townsend. Welcome back to the Scott Townsend Show. And today I have with me once again, Matt Clark. Matt, uh, it was is uh, helping with this a new, the, it's not a new series anymore. It's a series uh, entitled Crazy Love. We're doing a book review or setting, setting the book in the uh, men's group on Monday mornings, Crazy Love by Francis Chan. Matt, what's going on, man? Not much. Uh, I want to start off by, you know, not. I don't mean to kill your production value or anything like that. Okay. All right. Those of you who are watching this, Scott and I talk before he hits record and goes into his whole, you know, professional spiel. But what he does, he's like, all right, are you ready? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, hi, this is Scott. It's just so funny. <laughs> I respect we'll it. <laughs> I have, I have some place to come. I'm going to start doing this. You're going to be like, Matt, how you doing? I'm going to be like, I'm good, man. How you doing? <laughs> oh, you're the first person that's called me on that. But yeah, I do that every time. Well, and it's intentional too, because because I, 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 want, I want to turn into the camera and then have the camera zoom in on me at the same time, kind of like uh, David Muir on ABC News. So, <clears throat> so I cut it right before that. So you really don't hopefully notice but yeah if you're recording these videos like we so often do yeah well it's one of those that's the thing it's, it's one of those things that feels weird to do it and the more you right. do it it's less weird right. but the same thing applies to when you go on stage to speak like i can't go up on stage and talk like we're talking now you know it's just like hey scott how you doing everything's great blah 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 uh you have to project and the first time you do it, it feels really weird because you're like, yeah, I'm just screaming at these people and you're not, they hear it as normal. Right. You're right. It's just, I don't know, unless you've done it, it's, it's weird, it but is. necessary, but it gets, it starts to feel natural after a while. Yeah, for sure. Just like anything. Yeah. yeah you're the first person that's caught me, uh, called me out on that. So yeah, that's true. I'll look away. Hey, this is Scott Townsend. Welcome back to the Scott Townsend Show. And the have yeah. the camera zoom in. Whatever. Awesome. So anyway. So Crazy Love. Uh, <laughs> this week is chapter eight. Um, let's see, what is the name of it? Profile of the Obsessed. Profile of the, of the Obsessed. Thought it was a good chapter. Kind of had a hard time. Didn't agree with uh, one particular thing there that he said. That being said everything else seemed to i mean i, I yeah well, i mean who am I? I i it's just an opinion i i thought start with that chapter. huh start with that what did you not agree with no uh, the safety thing uh he was talking about safety and christians uh being obsessed with safety and you know praying before you go on a trip or something and uh uh kind of like uh well i don't know let's see uh he was talking about safety and can i get to it really quick here <laughs> profile of the obsessed chapter series crazy one hang on stay with me risk risk takers uh we are consumed by safety obsessed with it actually now i'm not saying it is wrong to pray for god's protection but i am questioning how we've made safety our highest priority We've elevated safety to the neglect of whatever God's best is, whatever would bring God the most glory or whatever would accomplish his purposes in our lives and in the world. 
people who are obsessed with Jesus aren't consumed with their personal safety and comfort above all else. Obsessed people care more about God's kingdom coming to this earth than their own lives being shielded from pain or distress. Okay, pain and distress is one thing. Safety is another thing. Safety is preventable. Pain and suffering, distress, you know, if, you get, uh, if you're sick or you uh, don't feel good or <clears throat> you've had some calamity that you could not avoid, a car wreck, a drunk driver, whatever. Uh, or, or a family member goes astray and, and it's, it's, it's painful to have to go through that. I get that. I get that. <clears throat> but to throw safety in there and say, you know, you're more concerned with sa safety is a top priority. I have to say, yes, it is a top priority. Excuse me for living. But um, I don't want people at work. I don't want people going home hurt. The key is to do your job, come home enjoy your family and go back the next day and do your work again. But if you go to work and uh, at the last company I worked with, we, there were several fatalities, um, people up on the roof, one guy fell through. Um, that was it done. Uh, there was no going back to work the next day. Family was wrecked. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there was some, uh, protocol procedure that they didn't follow that helped cause the accident. So safety is a huge, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have to disagree with this point, although it doesn't negate the whole book, but safety is a huge, this is me. You may be different. And those of you listening out there, it may be totally different for you too. I know I always talk about the oil field workers, but oil field workers, they safety is a huge concern for those guys. They want to get there safely. They're in a dangerous environment, could be fires. So you do everything you know to, do. Oh, oh man. Like the, uh, the uh, what's the gas that comes out? Oh, those of you listening, you're going to know what it is. H, H, uh, HO2 or HCO2, whatever. It's deadly. You can't smell it. You can't see it. You can't taste it. <clears throat> but it comes up out of the ground sometimes. And so a lot of uh, guys on the rigs and stuff will wear these little uh, detectors. It's like a... Uh, carbon monoxide detector that'll go off and everybody knows to park backing in so you can get out really quick they all have a flag like at the airport so you can see which way the wind's uh, blowing and depending on if your meter goes off or not you know which way the uh, gas is going to be moving so you want to get away from it and if one of your buddies falls down and is uh succumbs to the gas you're you're trained don't pick them up don't stop keep running because you're gonna you know it's better to have just you know one dead than two dead safety is huge issue and uh fires all that stuff could happen but you know if you're a secretary at, at, a, at a job or a dentist or or whatever and you get a paper cut or you trip and fall and twist an ankle whatever <clears throat> because of something stupid you did or didn't do, that's a problem. So <clears throat> let's all be safe. I, I was, I probably shouldn't say this. I saw, I'm not gonna say where I was, but I saw a kid riding a uh, pallet jack, like a skateboard. It's not cool, man. You're, you could fall off that thing. That's not the way that's to be operated. But when you're a young kid, it looks cool. Hey, I would have done the same thing if I was his age. 100%. But, <clears throat> you know, and I think the older you get, the more safety becomes an issue, because now you want to make sure that the days that you have left, you have as many days coming to you as possible without, you know, rolling the dice. I don't know if I'm going to want to skydive. I think I would still at this age, but definitely would have wanted to earlier. Um, but, you know, you started getting more cautious and, and, uh, there, there's my rant on safety. You asked, there it is. What do you I, think? Yeah, I mean, safety is important. I, I think it's more to the degree of, let me put it this way. We as Christians are, you know, followers of Christ, however you want to term that, take too lightly um, what happens to people if they don't have a relationship with God, if they don't get saved is how we term it we take it too lightly and we're just like, well, I just don't want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to put myself in, in harm's way just to speak to this person or 
But if we're not willing to do that, like Jesus did, Jesus put his life on the line, you know, went through all of the, <laughs> the things he went through uh, at the risk of losing his life and did lose his life to save people. I think an obsessed person is not afraid to put their life on the line to share the message of Christ and what he did, you know, I mean, is, is putting yourself in harm's way, going into a biker bar to reach the person that God told you to reach. Yes, it is. I and, get that. I, 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 yeah, well, I'm yeah. saying, what I'm saying is like, we, we take it too lightly that people are dying and going to hell. We don't think about it. We, we talked about it last week with like our, our spouse is getting sick. We're constantly thinking about ourselves and how this affects us. And we're not willing to do the things that are necessary to help people. We're not doing it. And myself included, it's just like, Oh man, I, I'm already home. I'm already comfortable. This person really needs, you know, it's just like, do I, yeah. do I want to, why are they calling me at 10, at 10 PM? Oh I my mean, God. I can't wait till tomorrow. Well, there's an I know element. you want to commit suicide, but come on, man. Can you just hold off until tomorrow at 8 a.m.? Yeah. And it's gotten so ridiculous to where it's just like, well, you know, I don't, this whole thing with the Bible and the translations of it and people are, you know, we don't go here because they use this version of the Bible and it's not, it doesn't lie. It's just, come on, man. I, I had a guy come into my office one time. This is a long time ago. And trust me, this is not my own wisdom. This is definitely like <laughs> um, the Holy Spirit using me, I, I would assume. He was just like, you know, me and my, my new wife. I mean, this guy was plugged into the church. He was serving. He was like really excited about what God was doing in his life. Gets married, which is awesome. And we're going to go to a different church. And I'm like, wow. I mean, as long as you're going to church, that's great. I mean, it doesn't matter, in my opinion, where you go to church. It's not about us versus them, but, you know, what's what what happened? He goes, well, my my wife doesn't like that you guys use the message version to preach from or to use in sermons. And I'm like, OK, I, I guess I understand that. And I said, but let me ask you a question. I said, if you were tied up on train tracks and a train was barreling at you, would you critique the way that I got to you to get you off the tracks? If I, you know, I mean, would it matter? He's like, well, I never really thought about it that way before. I was like, okay, well, think about it. Does it matter that I, you know, showed up on a motorcycle versus a car on a motorcycle does it matter that i sprinted that i dodged a tree that i you know started with my right foot or my left foot i got you i got you to safety you know i don't know i don't want to go off on that tangent but yeah it's just we get so caught up in the minutia of just like what other people think and all that stuff like how about just i i want to help people and i'll do whatever the hell it takes to help them if I have to put my life on the line to do it, you know, to share this message, there are people in other countries who, if they, they say they're Christian, will get ostracized possibly to the point of being, you know, martyred for it. And we're just like, I don't want to, because it's kind of uncomfortable, you know, come on, dude. Like, and again, talking to myself, I'm not pre, I'm not preaching at people on this is I'm, I'm speaking directly to myself as well, because there are, there are moments where I'm just like, oh, I just don't feel like it right now. Well, to be honest with you, Jesus probably didn't feel like being crucified, Yeah, but it was necessary. And if you go back to the scriptures, he clearly has a conversation with God where it's just like, if this doesn't have to happen, I would prefer that. But the most important part of that whole- The, the greatest understatement in the yeah. history of mankind. You know, I mean, it, the, way, the way he says it is more poetic or the way it was translated was more poetic. It's just like, if this cup could pass for me, you know, let that happen. But the most important thing that happens in that whole story is what he says after that, which is like, but not what I want, God, what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have that mentality. That's an obsessed person that cares about helping people. You know, it's just not yeah. my comfort. It's not what, you know, I feel is right. Not what, you know, my feelings are telling me. You limit yourself the moment you start restricting God on what he can do. And uh, think about all the people that could have been helped, but 
weren't because somebody was uncomfortable or they were just like, oh man, it's just, I got a lot going on right now and I can't really focus on that right now. No, dude, like this is life or death if you come down to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, yes, it's about inviting people to church. It's about getting people in church so they can hear God's word and grow. But what are you doing when you're at work? You know, who's God telling you to speak to that you're just not listening to, you know, you're not listening to God tell you to speak to those people. It's just, there's too much at stake here that we just take for granted. You know, we we're participants, but we're just sitting in the dugout or we're sitting on the sidelines. We're not, we're not a part of the, some of us are just happy to be on the team, you know, but it's just like, don't pass me the ball, dude. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Yeah. Don't put me at bat. The book talks about um, forget. It, it goes into some examples of uh, you know heart, <clears throat> extreme examples of friendship and how the obsessed are uh, uh, willing to forgive. Talking about you know people, the Amish, the uh, the example of the Amish person or family that forgave the person or the family that killed somebody in their family. We've heard people doing that before. We, we've seen it on the news from time to time. And you often wonder to yourself, how do you do something like that? Um, how, I mean, I've never had to do that, that extreme. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and, and so, like I said, the other Monday morning, I, you know, would you do that? I don't know. I, that's, that's impossible to say until it happens to you, which you hope it never does. But why is the first response for most of us in terms of an injustice to seek retaliation? I think it's a very uh, feelings oriented response. It's, you know, I can say I forgive you, but am I going to forget about it? And, and I, don't, I don't think that's all summed up in one moment. I think there's, there's time to forgive. It takes time, you know. If you're if you're able to instantly forgive somebody and just keep moving, I mean, my hat's off to you, but I haven't mastered it. Um, there's people in my life that if I thought about it long enough, I'm, I still probably hold grudges against for things that have happened in the past that really mean nothing to my future, you know, and it's actually just holding me back. Um, but I will say this, if somebody, you know, God forbid somebody, you know, causes harm to my wife or kids or, you know, anybody in my family, I don't know if I could walk in and look them square in the eye and say, I forgive you. But again, it's exactly what Jesus did. I mean, he's staring at the people who he created, who he has massive compassion and love for as they spit on him and curse him and make fun of him. And in his moment of his weakest moment, and the words that he says are so powerful. It's just like he asked God in that moment to forgive them because he knew that they didn't know what they were doing. He knew, he knew their hearts, you know, and he knew that they couldn't bring on the resolve that he was bringing in that moment. And so he did, he, like, again, like we take this part of the story, Easter's coming up or we take it too lightly the effect that what he did on the cross has on our lives today and it's uh, it's not something we're going to be able to do maybe in the moment but because of him doing it it's it gives me a good thing to look to for my own life you know there's people who live their whole lives not letting go of past hurts and it's destroying them it's not it's not hurting the person that did it to them because no, what is it nine times out of ten the person who hurt someone forgets about it <laughs> moves on you know mm -hmm. it's the so person how do you square that with the uh, our uh, judicial system and penal system you know it's all about going to court mm -hmm. and uh answering for your if if found guilty then then there's a reckoning there's a sentence there's a fine there's or all of the above uh and <clears throat> i think it's the right thing to do um, of course nobody asked me but <laughs> um i think that it's uh it seems right to you know cool. bring someone before a judge and be uh 
found guilty or not guilty. There's no forgiveness in any of this. Mm -hmm. and, and the judicial system and the, you know, how, you know what I'm trying to say. There's no, um, you know, if the family comes up and asks for, for or says you're forgiven, you're still going to be charged with. Yeah. And the, yeah. I mean, there's, there's repercussions for behavior, you know, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of miracles that have happened in the Bible and outside the Bible. Um, but let's, as an example, if I smoke my whole life and I pray to God, like, God, I need, you know, I need to stop this, but there's a repercussion for smoking for 20 plus years, you know, your, your health is not going to be as good. I mean, could God completely and totally heal you? Yes, he can. Um, but there's always, I mean, there's always a, uh, I'm not remembering the term. There's always a price to pay for the, the things you do. Is God going to forgive you for the things you do? Yeah. Uh, and to take it to a, a crazy degree, and it's not even comfortable to talk about I mean, there's an old joke. It's just like, I build bridges and I, I make buildings my whole life, you know, and then I do one wrong thing. And what am I remembered for? You know, um, are you forgiven in God's eyes? A hundred percent. Not going to bring it up to you ever again. But the repercussions of it are, you did this thing, you, you got to walk through it. You know, you got to, I don't know. We, we, we see a lot of pastors fall because of mistakes made and that's what they're known for it's not the years and years of you know building a ministry and becoming who they become it's all out the door and that's the repercussion of it and but does god forgive you through all of it and i love to tell people this all the time it's just like you know the worst thing you could have ever done in your whole life god will instantly forgive you for and you can move forward but there's still what you did just because God forgave you and forgot about it or, you know, doesn't mean the world has. Um, and that's hard for some people to swallow because it's just like, can we just move on from this mistake that I made? You know, um, that's a tough one. It also talks about, let's move on the talking about, uh, we talked about safety and justice, forgiveness, giving. So, so I have a lot to, say about this but i want to hear what you think giving talks about uh we need to love those in need as much as we love ourselves i get that totally get that i'm with that you know 100 done that here's the problem that i have maybe you can help me help work this will be a therapy are you session speaking, are you speaking as the voice of the people uh no this is me this is you okay <laughs> making sure but maybe this could be the voice of somebody out there listening. You know, Watching. somebody's thinking that way too. Yeah. Here's the deal. I'm in Houston and I'm at an intersection. I say Houston because this actually happened. And every time I go to Houston, it gets worse. There are homeless people walking the streets like zombies. And I've seen it increase over the years. And <clears throughs> They'll, it's to the point now where they will stand in the median as you're turning left, come up to your window, boom, 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 knock on your window, expecting you to roll it down and give them a dollar or something. Yeah. Which I, I didn't do. Uh, and I'll explain that why in just a minute. And they got, this one guy got really irritated. I thought he was going to smash the window in. Um, and so he walked down to the next car behind me and they gave him something, you know, and then he came back up to my car and he just stared at me and I just looked forward, you know. Okay. I'm not saying that you shouldn't give people uh, money. I'm what I'm, it's like seagulls. You ever been on the beach? Yeah. The locals do not want you to feed the seagulls. Why? Because when you start throwing bread up and the seagulls come down, yeah, that's all cute and awesome. And then you have this swarm of seagulls over and they're crapping everywhere. Yeah. So the people that are laying on the beach that like to do that on a daily or weekly basis or whatever are hating you because all these seagulls are uh, attracted and they're crapping all over everybody in their umbrellas. So shouldn't we, so, so, so I'm the same thing. So if you feed, if you give money in these situations, then they just flock around the intersections. Yeah. 
And now we've got a huge problem because with everybody feeding them, they are totally feeling entitled and, and, and want and think they should get the money. They, they grow expecting it to the point now where you can't hardly get through an intersection. I'm talking about Houston um, without being accosted by all these homeless people. And I, you know, so anyway, I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking, the solution is maybe give to Martha's, uh, Mary Martha, or give to some organization that is handle uh, that uh, that is uh, equipped to handle these folks, and then th these folks go to those places for help. Yeah, it's very controlled. It's very organized. They know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, if you give cash, you know, you always hear, "Don't ever give them cash because they're just going to spend it on whatever." You know. Well, what do you do? I mean, <clears throat> what are your thoughts? Help me through this. Should I be giving money to people on the corner? When I see people in Bartlesville standing on the corner, I'm thinking, boy, we're starting, we're starting a bad precedent here. If people start giving these people money, then in a year or two, we're going to have people swarming our intersections uh, looking for handouts. And uh, I, don't, I don't feel bad saying that either. Uh, but is that right? Wrong? I don't know. Am I just you know it's a it's up to your discretion like if you can read the situation right should you give them money you know and i have it i have it in certain situations but we've all heard that term like you can give a man a fish and he can eat for a day or you can teach a man to fish that's a way you can find out real quick if somebody's interested in changing their lives you know uh but what a what better way to uh say you love someone than to say hey you know i want to give this to you but i want to invest more into you i want to help you with your life you know i want you to get back on your feet um i think it's just discretion you know if you know like let's just say there when i lived in austin texas you know there were the same people for years standing on the corners i mean it wasn't just like a new influx of people you, you ended up knowing these people because they were there day after day after day after day you know and it's just like okay well you can just kind of tell they this is just what they do this is their life and from what I've heard, I mean, I've seen reports and investigations on it where some of those people make some pretty decent money, you know, <laughs> yeah. on the water. Um, I don't know. I think it's just discretion. It's just, you know, I, yeah, I, I can, I can see this person is hurting. I can, you know, I, I, I want to help people long-term, not instant. I want to teach them to fish. You know, outreach is a good thing and there are people who need it. And guess what? When there are people who need it, filtered in some of those people are people who just know how to work the system and you, you just help them too. Um, but you just have to, you have to give knowing that, you know, I might not be helping everyone, but I know I'm helping someone. You know, giving through your church, your local church, wherever, wherever you might be. Like, uh, like city, uh, you know, Sam was doing that. Now Ryan is the food outreach where they have trucks come in and then people, they let people know when they're going to be at a certain yeah. location. And then people can go to that location, very organized, very orderly. Yeah. Uh, they're providing not cash, but they're providing, you know, food that can, and stuff that can last on the shelf for a while. Um, that's so, you know, I'm, I'm not giving those people actual money you know what I'm saying, but I'm giving to the church and the church then is doing this outreach. Right. Well, something I can say for the church here is like, we're very diligent on what we do as far as like who we give to and why we're giving it. And, you know, um, we do try to invest into the lives of the people who, you know, line up for food. We don't just, you know, there are times where like the Thanksgiving outreach is a, is a great example. We just right. give it away. If they need it. Great. If they show up in a BMW needing it. We're going to give it to them, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause it's just the, it's the right thing to do. It's just a way to show love to people. Uh, but there are people who legit, you know, are wanting to change their lives and what, you know, again, like I said before, if there's 10 people who come through who don't really need it, at least we got to that 11th person who did need it. And now we're able to uh, minister to that person, minister to that family, help change, you know, it just, yeah. So you throw a net into the ocean trying to catch shrimp, you're going to catch a few fish here and there, you know, mm -hmm. and 
it's just the way it is. And you just have to think like, well, I might have helped people who didn't really need it, but I have to believe that there are people who did actually need it. And uh, I just threw my net and helped as many as I could. Right. You know, right. and just, you know, let one of the things I like to say is we try to do God's job for him. And what I mean by that is just like what we do initiates change, but we don't actually do the changing. We don't like, I can't, I can't come to you, Scott, and just be like, all right, Scott, I see that you're struggling with this. I'm going to help you. No, I'm just going to be there when you need help. And I'm going to guide you in the, the best way I know how, which is, you know, obviously in the spiritual side of it, I'm going to be there for you when you need to talk. I'm going to be there for you. If, I mean, if you need 20 bucks or you need help with groceries, I'm going to do that because I'm invested into this relationship and I'm showing you that I love you as a person, as I believe Christ would do if he was still walking the earth. Um, I think it's all important. Uh, I think there will always be people who take advantage of every situation. But I, again, I just have to believe that I'm helping the people who do really need it as well. Um, because what if we just shut it down and just, you know, we're not helping anybody, you know, nobody really benefits from that. But again, there's always people who get through there that you're able to minister to, and it really does mean a lot to them. Mm -hmm. um, but you're never going to get away from the people who know the system and know how to work it. Because you can see like, if, if, if there's an, <laughs> just for instance, if somebody comes to the church needing help with whatever, the moment we say, yes, we notice, okay, we're starting to get an influx of people because now it's gotten out. Um, hey, they gave me something, you know, hit them, you know, they, so the, the husband comes and then he sends his wife and then, then they send grandma and then they send their daughter, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. You have to believe that in the, in the scheme of things that, you know, by us being compassionate and showing love that there is some sort of seed planted in their heart, you know, that these people were cared enough you know, and we'll, we'll let God deal with the people who doesn't, who, who are not doing it for the right reasons. You right. Know? We're not to judge. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not judge. to judge, but we're not here to like, uh, I don't know. Are you, or do you really need it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I happened to be in Houston one time. I was sitting out in front of the Hilton America's hotel <laughs> waiting on Uber or something. And this person comes up to me and goes hey man can you give me 20 bucks or whatever you know i need some money and blah 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 i'm going to college and i can't you know blah blah blah, blah, blah. And I was like, here yeah so i gave him some cash and he walked on about less than five minutes later here comes another guy with almost the exact same identical story <laughs> it's like yeah you guys have been talking haven't you <clears throat> i gave him some money i was like i'm out of here I'll, I'll go sit somewhere else yeah there's a comedian uh his name's Sebastian Meniscalco. He's oh, talking, yeah. Talks about that guy is the greatest. He's like, uh, if a homeless guy comes up to me and he presents well, I will always give him money. But if you just come stumbling out of the bushes, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to give you anything. It's all about the presentation. You know, you <laughs> just scare the crap out of me as I'm walking by. Yeah. You know, we'll wrap it up, Matt. What do you think? This uh, book so far. Why did you pick this book to begin with? When we'll end on this uh, crazy. You know, I, I'll tell you exactly why I picked this book because um, I started this. I read this book for the first time, was blown away by it, and started a high school group full of guys. And high schoolers are tough to minister to, so when they read something and it definitely like challenges them, where they're just like, "I never saw it that way before." I love it when people say that. I've never seen it that way before, or I didn't mm -hmm. know it was that way, or man, this is, this is real. This is tangible. This is something I can understand. Right. It makes sense to me. Um, it just caught my attention. And anytime you can catch the attention of a high schooler, I mean, watch out. I mean, they say when you communicate, you should com like, you should write your message as if you're speaking to fifth graders. And we're mm -hmm. talking about when you present to adults, no, that's which yeah. means you need to be as clear and concise and not hard to understand at all. Mm -hmm. So when something hit those high schooler guys and they were meeting me at 7 a.m. in the morning consistently, I didn't have to follow up and be like, hey, guys, remember, we're meeting. They were hitting me up. I was just like, okay, this book has got some oomph to it <laughs> because these guys are responding. And there's just a bunch of practical things that 
I don't know, grow up, growing up, growing up in church, it was just very almost mystical to me. It's just like, oh, God's way out there. And I'm down here in this wooden pew, tired and bored, you know, and I'm never going to understand him. But when you can, when you can bring practical things out of the Bible and help people to understand them, which this book, in my opinion, does. Yeah. No, it just, it was kind of a breath of fresh air. Hmm. That's and cool. Just, can we be honest? As prideful as guys are. No, we can't be honest. No. We're, we're okay, going to lie. Everything's been a lie up to this point. So just, yeah, continue with the lies. Uh, <laughs> guys like to be, or people like to be led. I say that all the time. No, they do. People like, people they are like looking for truth, a leader. You know, exactly. And so when you bring truth, even though it can kind of rub you the wrong way, I think deep down inside, you know, like, I don't, I don't agree with this, but you know what? There's something about it that's just challenging the way I think. Mm -hmm. And that's something we as Christians can do more of is challenge the way we think. We get so caught up in the routine of like, this is what we do. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to speak this way. I'm supposed to dress this way. I'm supposed to talk this way. I'm supposed to walk this way. Um, challenge it. You know, one of the greatest things you can do when you leave Sunday morning church is take the message you just heard instead of just being like, oh, that was a really good message. Uh, I like what he said. He had some good points. How about you go home and study it for yourself and see if it's actually accurate? You know, that's not disrespectful to the to the past. I mean, if, if somebody took one of my messages that I spoke and said, man, I really I really cut that thing up and, you know, put it through the ringer and tested it. I'd be like, dang, thanks for listening, you know. Mm -hmm. But we just get caught up in the routine of it. You know, there are certain people like when you speak a message, if certain people come up to you and say, man, that was really good. You're just like, I don't even want to hear it. Get out of my, you know, <laughs> you're just the nice person. Yeah. But if somebody comes up and they're just like, I don't know, man, that one, that one really challenged me. I'm like, okay, you were actually listening. You weren't just looking for the fluff. You were, you were digging in. Or it's like Francis Chan was talking in this actually in this chapter about people coming up to him telling him oh man that's really great man you really hit at the nail on the head you know you really brought it home and he's like oh yeah you know you start to feel good about it and you start to you're you know you're feeling good about it and then he realized that he was taking the glory from god and just kind of absorbing it you know just tell me more tell me more instead See, of deflecting I'm so, it i'm so glad you brought that up because it is the truth because it is nice to hear, man, that was a really good message, man. Yo, man, you brought it. Well, and you, yeah. An obsessed person would be irritated at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not that you would just want to like be mean to people. It's just like, no, then you didn't get it, you know, because you should leave here totally just like, oh, my life means, I don't even know what it, my life means anymore, you know? Um, and we should be upset. Like we, the moment we let our, um, what is it called? Our pride kick in. It's just like, yeah, it did really good. We should be totally like, what am I thinking right now? I need to challenge everything about my life. If it's about me, then what was I doing? You know? And that's what I like about these podcasts after the men's meeting, because you'll talk about stuff. Other people will talk about things. And then you walk away and you go, hmm. They said this, or they said that. I agree with all of this, but I have a question about that. Yeah. And I always thought it'd be nice to, because, you know, at church, no one gets a chance to ask a question. Yeah. So you leave and you can't say, can you go more into detail about what this, what you were talking about here, you know, but in, a, in this podcast, which is the whole reason for, you know, having you on the show in this series is to you know, we only get an hour in the, in the, uh, well, don't even get an hour really, but 40 minutes to, uh, discuss a chapter in the book. But then, you know, then, then we get together and do a deep dive and go, you know, uh, I don't know about safety, you know, yeah. help me understand, or you said something, you know, last sun or last Monday morning, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. And you know, so, yeah. to your point, you know, in youth, we do this thing, you know, once or twice a year called a panel where we allow students to ask any question they want. Then, I mean, any question. And, and to make it fun, I'm just like, even if you ask stupid questions because you're just dumb and you want to be that kid, uh, I'm going to answer it. You know, 
within a respectful limit. You yeah. Know? Yeah. If you yeah. ever hit, if you cross the line, I'll let you know. We'll move on. Yeah. But if you ask a question, I'm going to answer it. And mm -hmm. so there was a question asked. And now, like, let's just say I just got up and, and preached on anxiety and stress. And it's just like, oh, you don't have to deal with anxiety and stress. You can just believe God and he'll heal you. And what, what do you get from that? You don't get anything. So besides the fact of what I said and the scripture that I use, let's say, you know, um, so to let, let's just say for, for scripture reference, I could just say, I could use the scripture for anxiety or stress, like just be still and know that I'm God. Meaning like, think about all of the stuff that I've done and compare it to your problem and just know that I'm well capable of handling it. That's, that's the, that's the thought process you should get to if you if you walk that verse out okay so let students ask questions and one one question came up is like can god completely heal my anxiety okay pretty basic question and so i answered it like this i said yes and no yes i do believe god can heal your anxiety and I, you always have to put a caveat in there of just like Am I saying don't go to a doctor for it? No, I'm not saying that. Doctors are gifted people. They're here for a reason. They tell you you should take a medication. You should take it if you feel comfortable taking it and your parents agree with it. All those things. I made sure I was covered there. And I said, no. I said, yes, he can. I do believe he can completely heal. You don't have to deal with it anymore for the rest of your life. Or no, because you choose to make that thing bigger than God. Okay. Not realizing what a controversial statement that was to make in church. Okay. But what it did do is it opened up discussion with one of my leaders who completely disagreed with what I said. You know, and that's healthy. I think that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Uh, just because I'm up there saying it doesn't mean it's always right. But in little smaller discussions, um, you're able to. Um, explain i'm not just saying god is just going to zap your anxiety and everything's going to be fine i'm not saying that god can't do it i'm not saying god can do it i'm saying this i believe that he will do it if you take the necessary steps to do it because there's so many promises in the bible of god saying you know i've already healed these things i've taken care of these things you don't you know quiet your mind pray to me don't worry about anything uh pray about everything there's all these scriptures to back it up and we like to put them on our walls and we like to see them and just know, oh yeah, I know he can. But that's like, hey, Scott, here's a gift. I'm going to put this right here for you. All you got to do is unwrap it and enjoy it. And you're like, yep, that's my gift. That gift's awesome. I love that gift. Are you going to open it? Probably not. I'm just going to let it sit there and just know that it's there. Um, I, I love doing these uh, because we are able to just break it down a little more and discuss it. And I think that's necessary in the discipleship process of just like, okay, I showed up not knowing this truth. Now I know this truth. Now I got to just kind of think about this truth. Eventually, I want to apply this truth so it can help me deal with this thing I'm dealing with. And if you really think about that, that's, that's discipleship. That's your faith growing bigger. You know, there's, there's still things in my life that I need faith to overcome. Um, but it's a process. Um, and I think having a discussion is the healthiest way to get to the answers you need to have. I think, you know, right. the founder of our church used to say something, uh, we want to grow large as a church, but we want to grow small at the same time, meaning we want to have, you know, a lot of people, you know, not for the sake of having a lot of people, but whatever's healthy will grow. But at the same time, we want to have groups where they can have discussions and share their concerns and share their hearts and share their fears and desires. And am I, am I wrong in thinking this way? Mm. Am I right in thinking this way? Can God do this in my life? I've been struggling with this for so long. What, what do I do? And just get counsel. And, and again, the more you see God do things in your life, again, the greater your faith in him will be. I've, yeah, seen, I've seen God do some amazing things. Uh, and it's caused my faith to grow. And it's only because I've had discussions, I've talked about it, not just, oh, good message. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. If you're and looking for your ears to get tickled, 
you you can read a self-help book but if you want your life to completely and radically change then have the conversation talk about it dwell on it do what the scripture says is take this word and like just think about the things that you know god is capable of and can he do it will he do it well there's many scriptures and many stories in the bible that back up the fact that yeah he definitely can you know now i got to get to that point i got to get to that point where i'm applying those principles to my life those truths uh to my life so i can live exactly how he wants me to live not like i've been living Boom. there you go well next week chapter nine uh who really lives that way we'll talk about that and uh matt thanks for joining us as always yeah. and sharing your wisdom and expertise and expertise no 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 all that all right well well for matt clark just <clears throat> and for matt <laughs> For Matt Clark, this is Scott Townsend. Thanks for joining us, watching, listening to the Scott Townsend Show. Have a great day. Everything's going to be all right. And we'll talk to you later. Scott Townsend Show is a Dietzo Man production. For more episodes, visit the Scott Townsend Show YouTube channel, listen on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Scott.